Thank you, everybody, for uh, coming this evening. Uh, I'm very pleased to have this uh, chance to, to speak to you. And uh, I'll count it a great. It's already something of an achievement here, I guess. There are more people than there are TV monitors. <laughs> and I'll know whether the talk has gone all right uh, by the end if people are staring at these monitors rather than at those two over there. <laughs> uh, so as you, as you know, the, the topic of my, my talk is uh, the Federal Reserve. On your invitations and the announcements uh, that uh, were online, uh, the subtitle is A Century of Failure with a Question Mark. So I guess I've kind of ruined the suspense uh, that you were counting on by leaving the question mark off my subtitle on my slides. Uh, so uh, I'm afraid uh, I have given away the, the plot, so to speak. But uh, I hope to convince you that it was hard not to because the evidence is so overwhelming, really, that the Fed is, a, is, a, is, is indeed a tremendous failure in pretty much any any uh, respect you can consider. Why are we talking about the Fed's record? Well, of course, as you probably know, we are fast approaching the uh, Fed's centennial, the 100th anniversary of its establishment. The Federal Reserve Law was passed in 1913, and uh, the centennial seems to be as good a time as any to ask whether the thing has done the job it's supposed to have done. Moreover, as you also know perfectly well, we've just been through, or we're still getting through, one of the worst financial crises of the um, post-Federal Reserve era, a crisis that has many people wondering whether the Fed is really the best institution we can po possibly have to manage our monetary and financial affairs. So for both of those reasons, I think it's a high time that uh, some attempt be made to judge whether the Federal Reserve has in fact been a success or a failure. Now, uh, I should say that when I ask that question, I'm not asking whether the Fed has been a success in the sense that it has accomplished a lot for certain special interest groups or for the bureaucrats who run it or for the federal government. Yes, of course the Federal Reserve has been a, a great success uh, judged by such criteria, at least the case can easily be made. No, the question I'm asking is, has the Fed succeeded in doing what it says it's supposed to have been doing? That is the question I'm asking. You can ask that other question, that's all right with me, but it's not the question I'm asking, and it's not the question that we need to ask if we're going to just, just make a case one way or the other for whether this thing should go on existing or not. So that's the question I wish to address. Now when I talk about this subject, <laughs> I have to admit, I, I can't help thinking about uh, The Wizard of Oz, and particularly the scene in, that, in the movie about the Wizard of Oz, in which uh, Dorothy and the others first approach uh, the great Oz. And this, of course, is the image of him you see. And the reason I think of this image is because I think a lot of people are in awe of the Federal Reserve. I think the Federal Reserve, among its other successes, has been very successful at creating a myth about itself as being an omnibenevolent and omnipotent, etc. institution. And so when you proceed to try to make the case that in fact the Fed has been a flop, you have to deal with this myth. And you have to deal with this impression people have. <laughs> that, you know, uh, this, 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 this institution can do no wrong. And so I feel sometimes that uh, I'm playing the part that Toto plays in the movie of getting behind all the, you know, the, uh, the smoke and mirrors and colored lights and drawing back the curtain on the ordinary being, or in, my ca in this case, beings, who run this institution and the very human flaws that the institution actually suffers from. And they're very, very serious, uh, though human flaws uh, uh, indeed. So let's first 
remind ourselves about the, how the Fed got established, everyone knows that the U.S. financial system went through a number of financial crises that ultimately led to the Fed's establishment. This photo is from the Panic of 1907, which was the last big one before the Federal Reserve Act was passed. So at that time, people did what they ought to have done. That is, they asked, is our currency and financial system the best possible system, or can we do better? So they established something called the National Monetary Commission in 1907, and that commission was charged with looking into the U.S. system and other systems in order to decide whether the U.S. system might be improved and how. And it, the result of this uh, effort was a large number of uh, volumes of published research, uh, including the one pictured here on the history of crises under the national banking system, and subsequent to that, the uh, uh, completion of a report by the Commission in 1910 regarding uh, possible uh, reforms. And it was a result of that report that uh, ultimately the Federal Reserve Act uh, uh, came to be embraced as an alternative to the pre-Fed system, a system everybody agreed was no good. And now, of course, a hundred years later, what I wish to argue is that we should be doing what was done back then, only I hope we can get it right this time. We should first of all ask, can we do better than our existing system? At least we should ask that if we can show that the current system, the Fed, hasn't been any better than the one that was done for no good a hundred years ago, right? We should be asking the same question. We should consider forming a new commission, and perhaps this time we can really do better. I hope we cannot do worse. So, uh, what are the Fed's own self-proclaimed uh, goals? Right? What does the Fed say it's supposed to do? Well, in the federal, original Federal Reserve Act itself, it says that the Fed's purpose is to supply a, quote, elastic, unquote, currency. We'll see exactly what that meant at some point later on. And thereby secure the integrity of the gold standard. So one of the goals of the Federal Reserve is to make sure the gold standard is kept going, right? I don't think I need to belabor the point that this, this goal was not one of the goals that the Federal Reserve has, has achieved. In fact, it was less than 20 years before the uh, gold standard was more or less permanently dismantled, though the final links to gold remained in some uh, form or another in place until 1971. All right, what are some other components of the Fed's uh, mission? According to uh, later amendments to the Federal Reserve Act and to statements on the Federal Reserve's own website, the Fed also exists to, quote, contain financial disruptions and prevent their spread outside the financial sector. That's just a fancy way of saying prevent them from turning into full-blown recessions or depression. Finally, the Fed uh, sees itself as being responsible for promoting, quote, effectively the goals of maximum employment, stable prices, prices and moderate long-term interest rates. So I want to examine all of these goals and ask whether the Federal Reserve has been successful in, in achieving them. And I'm going to start with some of the last named uh, objectives. I'm not going to say a lot about unemployment, right? One of the objectives of the Fed is to maintain high employment. Okay, well, is it doing that or not? Has it been doing that or not? It's very difficult to judge just by raw inspection of the data for the simple reason that the rate of employment or the rate of unemployment, those are things that depend on many, many factors of which monetary policy is just one, and, and not even perhaps the most important. But for what it's worth, here are the statistics, without wishing to make too much of them. The best unemployment statistics we have available shows, as you can see, an unemployment rate before the establishment of the Fed that was somewhat later than it had, lower than it has been in recent times. Then, in the first uh, decades of the Fed's existence, during the interwar period between 19 13 and 1945, you had, as it won't come as a surprise to anybody, a very high average rate of unemployment owing mainly to the Great Depression. Then uh, in the post-war period, until the 
dismantlement of the last link to gold in 1971, the unemployment rate was actually lower than it had been in any time in the past, on average. And then we arrive at the current period. Now, I don't want to make too much out of this chart, except I think uh, uh, I will make one point about it, which is that with respect to unemployment, as with respect to many other important macroeconomic variables, the interwar period stands out. That is, the period immediately following the Fed's establishment and until 1945 stands out as a particularly bad period. Uh, and it will be easy to make the case, too easy perhaps, uh, with regard to this variable and a host of others, that if you count this period of the first 20 something years of the Fed's existence, 30 years, pardon me, uh, uh, the overall performance of the Fed with respect to unemployment, with respect to other things, the overall performance of the economy has been much worse since the Fed's establishment than before. So one of the things I'm going to do is cut the Fed some slack when I'm discussing other variables. I'm going to allow often that the period from 1913 to 1945 was a practice period. They were just practicing. So we might leave that out and compare the overall performance of the monetary system uh, for before 1913 and after 1945. That's, that's spotting the Fed an awful lot, I think you'll agree. But even if we do that, I hope to convince you, the Fed's record doesn't demonstrate any distinct improvement over the lousy system it replaced in 1913. Right, so let's turn to prices. Here's a nice quote from Ben Bernanke saying that stable prices allow people to rely on the dollar as a measure of value when making long-term contracts, engaging in long-term planning or borrowing or lending for long periods. It should say periods. Now, this is an important quote. I think it's a good quote because I think that is indeed what stable prices really uh, are about. That's where they really matter. With respect to long-term planning, Benanke's especially right, uh, is, is exactly right. That's where uh, price instability can do the most harm. Very good. So, what has the Fed done to price stability? Well, first of all, let's look at the consumer price index. Uh, I, I, I take it, I don't have to emphasize too much that of course, the further back our statistics go, the less reliable they are. But the statistics I rely on in this slide and in others are the well-received ones that are regarded as the best available. Not necessarily correct, just the best available. I don't think anyone with the Fed would argue otherwise. All right, so what's the story with this price index, the consumer price index? As you can see, between 1790, that is the earliest uh, available uh, data for uh, and the beginning of this uh, the beginning of the US series of course and 1914 or so there's hardly any increase in the price level in fact uh, the only exceptions are during the temporary suspensions of metal payments of specie payments gold or silver payments during the second war with England as you can see that little blip there uh, again during the Civil War, of course. And then, of course, immediately following the Fed's establishment, you have the, the World War I era inflation. Though uh, I would uh, hasten to say the Fed was contributing to that. It was not just inflation owing to the effects of war itself. And then we see what, after the Depression, becomes gradual and actually fairly rapid decay in uh, the purchasing power of the dollar. You can see it more clearly here in a slide that shows exactly what's happened to the value of the dollar, and that's more than 95% of its value uh, disappearing over the, mostly, uh, all, all of this is during the post-Fed period, of course. Okay, everybody knows this, right? I mean, you all sort of vaguely know that the dollar has lost most of its value. You may not know that almost all of that has happened since the Fed was established with hardly any change in the 100 years before. I, I think my volume just went up, or just, I hope it went up in a desirable way. Uh, good. So, uh, but, 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 and this is an important but, for planning for the future, it's not obvious that the mere fact that 
money has been losing value has made planning harder. What really matters there isn't so much whether the price level is rising or falling or staying the same, but whether it's easy to predict where the price level is going to be some years hence. So we really need a statistic that shows how hard the price level has been to forecast in the post-Fed versus the pre-Fed period. And that's what the tables I'm about to show you demonstrate. Oh, this is the monthly inflation rate since the Fed's establishment. Um, one of the things I'd like to point out, uh, pardon me for interrupting uh, my uh, argument before, uh, people think the worst monthly inflation rates uh, uh, in uh, modern uh, history in the U.S. have been those from where those of the 70s when we had the oil crisis and so on. In fact, they were experienced immediately after the Fed's establishment during World War I, where, as you can see, month monthly adjusted inflation rates, that is, annualized from monthly uh, data, almost hit 25 percent, which is much higher than anything from the 70s or, or uh, 1980. And, uh, and uh, that was, to a very large extent, the Fed's doing. It wasn't just because there was a war going on and so there was less being produced. It was because the Fed was purposefully trying to aid the war effort, especially after the U.S. set for the war in 1917, keeping interest rates low to boost the demand for liberty bonds, to help pay for the war, and so on. And inflation was, to a very significant extent, therefore, a consequence of Federal Reserve policy. All right, let's go back to this. Let's go on to these uh, uh, other charts. Okay, I'm going to get a little bit technical now, but I can't help it because this really matters. It really is apropos of Bernanke's arguments about why price stability is important. We want people to be able to have a good guess of where the price level is headed in the future if they are to be able to make long-term investments. The harder it is to know where prices are heading, the harder it is to make those investments. Now, you could have inflation where the price level is nevertheless very predictable. If prices rise exactly 10% every year, you know exactly where they're going to be in 100 years. So the, the uncertainty about where the price level is going to be is not necessarily positively related to how fast the thing is going up. Does that make sense? So we don't know directly from the price level evidence whether things have gotten worse as far as predictability of the price level since the Fed compared to before. But these statistics, these charts, do tell us. What they show is a so-called forecast error at different <coughs> horizons, right? Uh, for example, the five-year horizon means how big the errors are going to be if you're making a forecast about where the price level is going to be five years hence. The 10, 30-year horizon is how big they're like they will be if you're predicting 30 years hence, and so on. The two columns show the pre-fed forecast errors and the post-Fed forecast here. As you can see, for the five-year horizon, the post-Fed, and by the way, here again, we're leaving off the first 30 years of the Fed because, everybody repeat after me, that's practice, that's only practice. We're only going to count the years when the Fed has supposedly got its act together after, since 1945. Right? Believe me, throw in the interwar period, the Fed does not look better. It always looks worse. Right? So we're going to cut the Fed slack, as we're going to do consistently, and look at the forecast errors of plan trying to predict the price level for the pre-Fed period, meaning before 1917, 1913, or 1914, and the post-1945 period only. All right, doing that, the five-year forecast horizon error, right, five-year horizon forecast error, on average isn't obviously worse for the Fed. You might make the case it's a little bit better. It bounces around a lot more, but, uh, but this is what we're seeing where, how big the error would be if you were making a forecast in 1945, in 1950, in 19, you see what I mean? Um, as soon as we go to the 30-year horizon, right, and this is the one that matters for longer-term investments, it's clear that the forecast error is always bigger under the Fed than it would have been under the old system. And when you get to the 100-year horizon, there's absolutely no contest. There's only any forecast error under the old pre-Fed system 
and a very big forecast error under the new. And that's not surprising, because under the old system, as we've seen, there's a tendency for the price level in the very long run to end up more or less where it started. Right? And that is not an accident that's an, uh, a due to the way the gold standard operates in the absence of a simple bank. Okay, now let me ask you a question. This is like a quiz, right? Do you think anyone would have been crazy enough, any corporation, to issue a 100-year bond, and anyone would have been crazy enough to buy the bond in, nine, in say, 1850? Yes or no? You think there would have been such bonds, a market for them? Yes. Why not? They're not. You can predict that the price of it, so the interest rate is whatever you think it's going to be. You know, you say 5%, well, it turns out that, it will, that will be a 5% interest rate, right? Would you think that such bonds were popular in the post-Fed period? What do you think happened in the market for those bonds? They're gone. They're gone. Somebody tried issuing some more around 2000. This is a great moderation. Oh, things are okay again. <laughs> right? Forget it. Now, this is about the question, has the Fed created an environment where prices are predictable so that there can be long-term investment, etc.? That's what Bernanke says it needs to do. The answer is no. It's done the opposite. Things have gotten considerably worse. Now, you might say, and I've heard people say, all right, well, the Fed has caused inflation, and it's caused inflation at a varying and hard to predict rate. But at least it has gotten rid of deflation, which we all know is horrible. Well, it hasn't. And it hasn't done that in two different senses. First of all, we have to recognize that there are two kinds of deflation. There's bad deflation, which is caused by shrinking demand, right? It's Demand and supply okay with most of you, or are some of you ready to watch sports? <laughs> so, right, so that bad deflation happens when the demand for goods, which is just the total amount being spent over time, right, collapses or declines. So there's less money chasing after whatever the available goods are, and you get a decline in uh, prices and perhaps an output, in the short run, an output and prices. It's about deflation. All right, we don't want that. Or at least I think most people would say this is something to be avoided. But did the Fed avoid it? As a matter of fact, the worst episodes of bad deflation in U.S. history pretty much all occurred under the Fed's watch. We all know about the Great Depression episode, and here you can see two. This chart shows two lines. One is uh, what's happening to output, the other one is what's happening to the price level. Whenever you see them both output and the price level collapsing, as you do here in the 30s, right, this gray area, that, they can only both be going down because that demand schedule is going down, right? Does that make sense? Right? So this is bad deflation. The other, one of the other bad episodes is, of course, this one. You remember this one. And here is the CPI and real good gross domestic product. See how they're both going down together? That's bad deflation. That's collapsing demand. So bad deflation hasn't been eradicated by the Fed at all. And indeed, as I said, two of the worst episodes, actually three because there was another one in the early 20s, happened on the Fed's watch. Now, there's another kind of deflation. And that deflation isn't depressing at all. It has, it's a result of gains in productivity from transportation, technology, and other things. So what's happening in this kind of deflation is the supply schedules are shifting out. More goodies are put on the market. For available inputs, you get more output. That drives prices down, right? It is deflation. But prices are going down, but quantities are going up. Now, this is not a bad sort of deflation at all. In fact, we should all welcome it. Imagine that goods started dropping like manna from heaven all of a sudden. Prices are falling, and goods are getting cheaper. What are you going to do? Complain? Say, oh my god, this is terrible, look at the prices. Are no, you're going to be out picking up goods, right? And, and it's, not, it's not a bad thing, that sort of deflation. Of course, we haven't had goods dropping like manna from heaven, but most of the time in a healthy economy, you have improvements in productivity. In the old days, before the Fed, there was a tendency in the short run for those improvements to bring deflation. You see how there tends to be deflation? Then there are episodes when the price level rides because it's interrupted either by suspension of the gold standard 
which normally would operate in a way that would tend to allow deflation in the short run, or because of old discoveries, which stop the deflation. And that's fine. But the point is, when you see deflation in these periods, right, it's mild, and it tends to go along with the rate of productivity growth. The Fed has wiped that out. It's wiped out good deflation. You never see it anymore, right? Prices never fall, no matter how much productivity improves, which it's still been doing, you know, most of the time. So the Fed's gotten rid of the good kind of deflation, the kind we wouldn't necessarily want it to get rid of, but it's done nothing about bad deflation except create some of the worst episodes of it. So it's, its record on deflation, far from uh, making up for its record on inflation, actually uh, uh, adds to the overall failure of the Fed to do a good job in administering or managing the behavior of the price line. Does that make sense? All right, let's start talking about the output of the economy. And I apologize, I know I've got a lot of Austrians here. You hate these aggregate measures, right? <laughs> CPI, output. Oh, let's talk about relative prices and, you know, the structure of production. Well, uh, I would, except that this is an imminent criticism, right? It's like, the Fed says that it's doing a good job with CPI. Okay, let's see. The Fed says it's doing a good job stabilizing output. Okay, let's see. Let's talk in their terms and see. So, this chart shows the deviation of GNP. It's a measure of real output. This is not, uh, this is deflated, the real GNP from trend. Now, this particular chart shows us what has long been the standard textbook measure of these deviations, based on what where the standard GNP measures, particularly for the pre-Fed or pre-1920s period. And here again, right? If you were to just take this chart and divide, you know, in 1914, look at the average deviation this way and the average deviation this way, the Fed would do worse even with this conventional textbook data, right? The average deviation is higher because the practice period is so bad, right? Practice period, but that's practice, it's practice. Come on, give them a break, right? So what happens if we look at post-1945 and pre-1914? With this data, the Fed has stabilized output since the war, or at least, I shouldn't say it that way, because you really shouldn't. There's many factors going on. Output has been more stable, so it isn't obvious that the Fed is doing a good job, right? From that simple criteria. However, economic historians have gone to work on the early data, data up to the very early Fed years, and for various reasons have determined that the old measures of GNP, by the way, measures constructed by an economist, Kuznets, a very good economist, who said, do not use these for such comparisons because they aren't any good, right? Someone has gone back and looked at that data and said, well, here's what's wrong with it, let's come up with some better measures. And the result is this picture. Now, turns out if you take this picture, and of course the average performance of the Fed, including the practice period, has again been inferior with this data, but the big difference here is that the pre-Fed period is smoother. Therefore, if you take the average of the pre-Fed period and the, compare it to the average deviation for the post-45 period, now there's hardly any difference. The post-45 period is a little more stable, but it's very trivial. So according to these revised statistics, right, no improvement or an insignificant improvement. By the way, this is the economist who came up with those statistics. And the reason I'm showing you this picture is so you don't think it's some crazy, wide-eyed, Austrian, anti-Fed person. It is Christina Romer, who, as you can see from the picture, was uh, indeed the, the, the president of the Obama's first uh, uh, Council of Economic Advisors. So uh, she's not the kind of person you would think would go out of her way to try to make the Fed look bad. In fact, nowadays, she's tending to go around pretending she didn't come up with those statistics at all. But anyway, so, so th those, those are what, what we might call, uh, you know, uh, mainstream revisions of the statistics. Now, I said a moment ago, right, you can't just look at these statistics and say, well, the Fed's 
done a good job or the Fed's done a bad job. You can only say that the statistics don't show an obvious improvement since the Fed versus before, but there are other factors. So the question arises, right, let's go back to this chart for a minute. Well, maybe the overall stability of output isn't much better than it was before the Fed, but maybe other things have changed since the Fed was established in a way that would uh, make for more instability independently of what's happening in the monetary policy so that if in fact things are just as stable as before, only slightly more stable, that still means the Fed is doing a good job given that it's, given that it's operating against other factors working towards greater instability since 1914. I'm almost out of breath saying that, but did you make did that make sense to you? Okay. Well, I know of only two such factors that are really obviously important. They are, first, the role of fiscal policy. Government has gotten a lot bigger, and fiscal policy has gotten uh, to play a much larger role in the performance or stability of the economy because we now have a government that actually tries to use fiscal policy as a means for stabilizing the economy. A second possible, so one possibility is that fiscal policy has tended to work toward greater instability and the Fed's doing a great job despite having to fight against the, the effects of, of uh, the change role of, of the FISC, right? Uh, another possibility is that the economy has been more subject to supply shocks since the Fed was established. Now, monetary policy is good at trying to stabilize demand, but it can't do much about harvest failures and uh, wars and those sources of instability, these supply sources of instability. If those have gotten worse, then the fact that overall stability isn't much better than it was before the Fed could still mean that the Fed itself has been doing a great job. You see what I mean? Right? Except the problem with both of these possibilities is they point the other way. Here, here's government outlays for state and for uh, 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 and local uh, uh, as well as federal government since 1910 or a little bit before. All right, here's the point. The bigger government outlays get as a percentage of GDP, the more stability the economy should have other things being equal. I didn't say the greater total output, right? You'd all throw you know, tomatoes at me if I said that. Of course, big government doesn't make for a more productive economy. We all know that. But it can be stabilizing in the simple sense that when you have a big government, guess what? The government doesn't get smaller when the economy is uh, subject to adverse shocks. It tends to get bigger. So if you think of total output, Y plus C plus G, where G is government, right? The G component, component tends to be stabilizing. So the bigger G is as a percentage of the total, you'd expect the economy to look more stable. Well, it's gotten huge since the establishment of the Fed, and it was very flat before that. So if anything, we would think that even a Federal Reserve that was no better than the pre-Fed arrangement would oversee an economy that is, as far as this factor is concerned, much more stable, would have an easier job. Yet we see that the economy hasn't got much more stable. If fiscal policy is tending to make it more stable, and a lot according to these measures, monetary policy must be doing a really bad job, worse than the original series of standard deviation behavior would tend to show. And what about supply versus demand shocks? Well, here's some more statistics. These statistics, I won't go into the gory details, show the percentage contribution of different kinds of shocks, supply versus demand, to overall fluctuations in output in the economy in the pre-1914 versus post-World War II period. And uh, the, the uh, contribution of the shocks will depend on the horizon or how long ahead you look. And generally what happens is, right, uh, the uh, role of supply shocks tend to have, right, their effects in the long run tend to wear out. Okay, anyway, as you can see, the numbers of showing the percentage contribution of supply shocks for pre-1914 are huge. The, the, the shorter the years ahead, the greater the differential between pre-19 and post-World War II. But it's always, supply shocks are always bigger before 1914. Why? Mostly because we were such a heavily agricultural economy before 1914, so these 
shocks to agriculture from the weather and from uh, pestilence and you know uh, disease they were much more important right there's nothing quite like them that affects manufacturing is there right have you ever heard of a you know a, 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 a steel plant you know, you know uh, getting a blight right so there's nothing like that and that's why supply shocks are much less important again if we take this factor into account we should have expected vast improvements in the overall stability of output in recent years apart from any influence of changed monetary institutions we don't see that maybe it's because the monetary institutions though they've changed have made things worse maybe probably right okay one last thing right i mean not not the last but related to output we've been looking at just standard deviation of output right simple statistics there's another statistic we can look at, a set of statistics, that uh, is the, the length and duration of business contractions, right? A business contraction is a period of sustained, you know, more than one quarter, more than two quarters sometimes, downward movement of output, right? The NBER, or National Bureau of Economic Research, is the one that determines whether we've had a contraction and when it ends, right? Do we necessarily like their way of timing contractions or dating them or deciding whether they exist or not? No, but it's kind of the standard way. Okay, let's just look and see what it implies. Well, I'll let Christina Romer speak here again. Here's what she has to say about uh, the comparison, once again, of pre-1914 and post-1945 because the years between 1914 and 1945 were practice. practice, right. So, allowing for the practice period and setting it aside, I think you all know what the contractions, that there were some contractions of economic activity during that period, you've maybe heard of. Right. Recessions have not become noticeably shorter over time. The average length of recessions is actually a month longer in the post-World War II era than before the World War I. There's also no obvious change in the distribution of the length of recessions between the pre-war and post-war era. Christina Romer, 1999. <laughs> Why am I stressing the date of this quote? Oops, where did that happen? <laughs> Because, of course, if you add subsequent evidence to what Romer bases that conclusion on, uh, the Fed, of course, looks a lot worse. So, we've covered the behavior of the price level and the predictability of movements in it. We've covered the uh, variability or, or uh, uh, stability of output. We've covered uh, recessions. Uh, contractions. What about banking crises? Has the Fed at least done something about banking and financial crises? Well, you know it hasn't done away with them, but has it at least improved on things before? Well, here is, uh, first of all, Elmas Wicker's conclusion about panics, banking panics, and uh, crises, same thing, before the Fed. He notes that despite the impression you sometimes get that panics were very common before the Fed, and they were more common in the U.S. than in most countries, uh, there were no more than three major banking panics between 1873 and 1907, and two incipient panics in 1884 and 1890. Twelve years elapsed between the Panic of 1861 and the Panic of 1873, 20 years between the Panics of 73 and 93, 14 years between 93 and 97, that's three banking panics in half a century. The exclamation mark is Wickers, uh, not mine. And in only one of the three, 1893, did the number of bank suspensions match those of the Great Depression. If you read Wick uh, uh, Wicker's book on the latter episode, there were five banking panics in the space of just about five years. Looking at total bank failures doesn't quite tell you what's happening to the number of panics, but it gives you some idea. It's shown here, we're looking at total uh, number of U.S. bank failures. The subsequent slide will give you the value of deposits at, fa at, at failed banks in case you think it matters or makes a difference. And what you can see here is that far from there being a decline in total bank failures or crises or panics, as we know from Wicker, uh, the incidence of these goes up markedly after the Fed's establishment compared to the pre-Fed period. 
Now, it's true that they suddenly stopped for a while in 1934. But, of course, the Fed wasn't established in 1934. Something else must have happened in 1934 that's not the Fed that's ending the crisis, or maybe the Fed's behaving totally differently. Does anyone know what's happening in 34? The FDIC. The FDIC is what's happening in 94. Here's the statistics with the total value of deposits. Doesn't look any different. Now, the FDIC, I'm not about to say anything nice about the FDIC, but if we're going to give anyone credit for ending banking crises and reducing bank suspensions after the in the post-Fed period, we need to give it to the FDIC, not just because of the timing, but because there's all sorts of evidence that the presence of insurance is really what put an end to runs and, and, uh, and widespread failures. Now, as you know, uh, even, even the quiet post-FDIC regime didn't last, as uh, we all know too well from the recent crisis. Did the Fed at least do a good job during that? Not according to Bill Buter, another very prominent but not Austrian economist, uh, who writes, summing things up because we don't have time to go into all the details. Mm -hmm. You probably heard other talks about this. You certainly could hear, hear many. Fed interventions, including its rescue of Bear Stearns, appear uh, to have been designed to maximize bad incentives for future reckless lending and borrowing by institutions affected by them. That's not exactly a nice verdict on what the Fed did. But I want to say a little bit more about it. I want to refer, first of all, to the views of Walter Badgett. Badgett, by the way, was the second economist, of, uh, uh, the editor of The Economist magazine. But uh, he's perhaps at least as famous for having authored a book called Lombard Street in 1973, in which he developed what has since come to be known as the classical rule for last resort lending. And that rule was that the central bank, right, he was then referring to the Bank of England, but the rule has since been generalized. Central banks should, during a crisis, lend freely but at high rates of interest to all solvent institutions. The idea of the classical lender of last resort rule was that the, the role of the central bank was to save the sound components of the financial system by making sure they don't suffer uh, collateral damage from the failure of those institutions that have been unsound, that have made unwise investments. So the central bank is supposed to channel liquidity to the sound institutions, not to the unsound ones which are supposed to be allowed to fail. Unfortunately, Badgett's classical rule for last resort lending is honored by central bankers almost always in the breach, and that was certainly true in the recent crisis, as this chart shows. This shows the different components of the Federal Reserve assets. Uh, basically, uh, this, this light gray zone here shows what's happening uh, to the Treasury securities that were, prior to the crisis, overwhelmingly the main security on the Fed's balance sheet. So basically what the Fed does normally is it provides liquidity to the marketplace by buying U.S. government bonds in the open market. That uh, The funds from those bond purchases go into the so-called federal funds market, which is a competitive market where banks bid for them for uh, supplementing their reserves and making sure they remain liquid and can settle and all that. Now, Here's the period, the early period of the crisis, and you see all this, this dark area, all right? Uh, that's direct lending to certain financial firms. Now, first of all, the firms that were getting all those direct loans were not, at least the, the overwhelming uh, consensus is they were not sound. They were the ones that had loaded up on subprime junk, were in bad trouble because of it or because of their dealings with other financial institutions with, that had a lot of such junk. The Fed was rescuing, lending to these bad institutions. That's not budget. That's not classical. But it gets worse because notice what it was doing. It was cutting back on its open market purchases in order to offset that lending. In other words, instead of giving liquidity to the sound firms to keep them from suffering collateral damage from the failure of the unsound ones, it is rescuing the unsound 
firms using funds taken from the general marketplace, that is, funds that would otherwise have kept the sound firms solvent. That's Badger turned on his head. What's that's the scale trillion. on my life? That's what? trillions. That's a, that's that's tr that's thousand million. Right? Yeah, 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 yeah. That's, that's trillions. trillions. Yeah. That's trillions. Trillions, trillions, trillions. Yeah. Badgett, by the way, I cannot say it often enough. Badgett made his recommendation about last resort lending as a, what economists would now call a second best solution to England's problems. You know what the first best solution was, according to Badgett? Don't have a central bank. <laughs> and he's very explicit about it. And the central bankers are always citing Badgett. They say, you need us. You need a lender of last resort. Badgett says so. No, Badgett says, if you're stuck with a central bank and you want it to not do too much damage, here's what, how you want it to behave. That was what he said. It's like, suppose you're stuck with a lion in your house, right? A man-eating, potential man-eating lion. You can't get rid of it. Okay, so you train it to get the paper, right? Does that mean that your neighbor now really needs to get a lion so he can have his paper in the morning? So, so here's what Badger says. He said, look, at the end of his book, he says it in a couple of ways. I've tediously insisted that the natural system of banking is that with many banks keeping their own cash reserve, which they're issuing their own currency, right? They're keeping their own cash reserves. The Scottish system was on no doubt in, in, in Badger's mind, as it were back then, with a penalty of failure before them if they neglect it, right? You do a bad job, you fail. And yet, I propose to retain uh, this other system. Uh, I should have uh, modified it. I, I, yet, I preserve the retain the current system with a centralized reserve in the Bank of England and only attempt to mend and palliate it with this last resort lending rule. Why? Well, he says, I can only imply that I propose to retain this system because I'm quite sure that it is of no manner of use proposing to alter it. You might as well or better try to alter the English monarchy and substitute a republic as to alter the present constitution of the English money market founded on the Bank of England. The funny thing about that quote is that today, today I dare say, you probably could much more easily get rid of the English monarchy than get rid of the Bank of England. So much more sacrosanct has the Bank of England become uh, compared to the monarchy itself. And the same is true here in the US, of course, we don't have a monarchy, but we've got a Fed and it's sacrosanct, or so it seems to be, in the minds of many people, which is Shame. Okay, so what is, where does all this lead? Does it mean I want to turn the clock back? I think we should turn the clock back. It's something they throw at you if you make the kind of arguments I'm making today. No, I don't want to turn the clock back. I've recognized all along that the pre-fed system was a lousy system. Of course we don't want to go back to it. But the fact that it was a lousy system means two things. First, it means we don't want to go back to it. It also means that if we have a system now that's been doing even worse, we don't want to keep that, right? So we need something that's not the old system and that's not the current system. What could that be? Well, if you go back to the old system and really look into why it was lousy, you find something very interesting. The lousiness of the prefed system wasn't due to our lacking a central bank. It was due to other financial restrictions peculiar to the U.S. currency system at the time. And we can see this quite clearly if we look at our northern neighbor, Canada. Remember, the Fed was established to set up to have an elastic currency while maintaining the gold standard. Here's a chart showing what happens to this, what was happening in the 19th century, the last couple decades, in the early 20th to the supply of national bank note currency, which was our paper currency, and Canadian currency. The scales are different, you can't see them here, but Canada multiply, multiply Canada by 10, Canada by 10 you have the US. So the national bank notes, look, the country's supposed to be growing, and it is growing, the supply is shrinking, 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 right? And then the other thing is, then start, they make some reforms, it gets a little better, but the other thing is there's no seasonal adjustment. Every year in those days, in Canada and the U.S., there's a peak seasonal demand for currency connected with moving the crops, where you have to pay migrant workers, they don't keep checking accounts, and so on. Very few people, by the way, kept checking accounts back then. So, now you look at this other line for Canada, and look, currency supply, it's growing slowly, secularly, right? And lovely spike every autumn, just where you think it should be if it's if supply is following demand. Oh, they must have a central bank doing their great job, you know, right? right? 
this just just on top of things that can't? No, they don't. Wait a minute, they can't have this unregulated system in like the US. No, they don't have an unregulated system like the US. They really have an unregulated system. We don't. We have a economy where national banks can only issue notes subject to a more than 100% backing requirement for the bank has to consist of government bonds, right? So guess what happens? Starting after, World War, after the Civil War, the U.S. government's retiring its debt. Now, think of what happens to the currency supply. If the government retires all its bonds, what is the maximum stock of national currency that's available to the economy? Zero. Zero. So, retire the debt. Sounds great. Oops, no currency. Right? That's not a good system. Why do they have that system? Because during the Civil War, they needed a way to boost the demand for government bonds. So they created the national banks and said, okay, you can only issue currency if you buy our bonds. Right? So it's all fiscal. So this regulation created for wartime finance becomes a, a, a source of tremendous problem. Also with that arrangement, there's other details I won't go into, you can't have any short-term adjustments in the currency supply because the bond deposit rules make it uneconomical to engage in such adjustments. So Canada, what do they have? They have a system of competing banks of issue. It's, it's, it's much concentrated. It starts with about 40 or 50 and eventually goes down this, uh, you know, uh, a couple a dozen by the third. Uh, so there's not free entry, but these banks, though, can branch nationwide, which U.S. banks can't. So they're strong and diversified. That's the other thing our system lacks. Our banks were not allowed to branch, with few exceptions, until recently, until the 90s. So uh, the behavior of the currency supply you see in Canada is the result of unregulated, largely unregulated competitive competition between these competing banks of issue. And the Canadian system is notoriously crisis free. Notoriously crisis free. Need to read a newspaper from back then. The currency question, how Canada has solved it with fair success. Sounds like some recent headlines about Canada during the subprime crisis. Okay. Much flexibility secured. Circulation rises in crop demand. Well, you can read it. In the Great Depression, before Canada set up a central bank, how many banks failed in Canada? Here's the answer. 5,000 US banks failed in the first, uh, from 1929 to 1933. These are some of the Canadian bankers. So, there was an alternative arrangement that really would have solved the problems. It wasn't a central bank arrangement. Today, we can't replicate exactly that kind of system. One thing that's gone, may be difficult to replace ever again, is the gold standard. Getting that back is very hard. But the point is, there are alternatives, and we should be talking about them right now, because right now we have a system that's as bad as any system this country's ever had. Thank you very much.